productive, right? And yet we see that people who do go to, you know, receive higher education and go on are more productive than those who don't on average. So what's going on? How can it be that if we don't learn and retain very much as undergraduates, that higher education nonetheless makes a contribution to our human capital? Well, there are some possibilities. One might be that we don't learn any, that we don't learn much, that we remember, but we, we learn things we don't realize we're learning. It sort of seeps in, in all this stuff that I was taught as an undergraduate seeped into my, unco- my subconscious and it influ- influenced my productivity in some magical way. Okay. Or perhaps what happens is we learn something, we promptly forget it as we walk out the door after the final exam. Yes, I was like that. But it becomes easier to relearn it. And that's a possibility. You know, when I took the math courses over again, it might have been a little easier just because I had gone through it. I think it was easier because I knew where I was going, I knew what I had to learn, I knew what I had to do. I don't think I remembered any of the, of the math uh, from, the, from those courses. And maybe there's just a general aura of learning. The general atmosphere may indicate a heightened level of productivity. One thing I did learn, but this was uh, as a graduate student, from, from, from Robert Fogel, as a matter of fact. I mean, I wasn't really a graduate student, but I'd already hadn't received my undergraduate degree, and I was taking graduate courses, and that was a graduate course that I took from Fogel. One of the things that I learned was the importance of the counterfactual. Robert Fogel won the Nobel Prize in economics, in economic history, for two, for two important works. The first one was his, his uh, dissertation, later published as a book, on the importance of railroads in economic history. He was telling us that he went to see a, a former professor, and the pr- former pr- professor said, what's your dissertation on? And Fogel said, it's on the, uh, the contribution of uh, railroads to uh, our economic growth. And the former professor said, oh, that's not very interesting. Lots of people have done that. Fogel said, but I'm going to show that it wasn't important. Okay. Oh, and then the professor said, that's too interesting, in the sense that uh, that's, that's too controversial. But what Fogel did was... It, examine the question, what would have happened if there had not been any railroads? What if there had only been wagons, canals? And, it, and, and he hypothetically constructed a lot of canals and showed that the social saving of having railroads was not very high. Fogel became better known for his book, A Time, a Time on the Cross, about US slavery. And again, he used the counterfactual. What would have happened if there had been no slavery? Or In this different section, what would have happened if there had been no civil war and if people had not used social, political, and legal and military force to free the slaves? And again, he he showed that slavery was indeed a profitable business for the the slave owners. It didn't die out because of bad bad economic conditions. It died out because of the social and moral fabric of of, of, of human beings as we grew up and as we matured. So what am I trying to say about the counterfactual? Let's face it. People who do well in school are generally smarter and harder workers. They would probably do well even without the specific education they receive. That's a pretty controversial thing to say in a university. So what is it that higher education really does if it doesn't do much for human capital? If it doesn't make us more productive, what is it that higher education is producing for us? The way I have described it to people over the years, and I've never thought about it very rigorously until now, and some of you might question whether this is rigorous, I think of it as a filter or a sieve. What we're doing is we're giving you all kinds of hurdles to jump. We're We're giving you all kinds of puddles to jump, tortures to withstand, whatever it might be. We are credentializing you. We are sending a signal to the rest of the world that you are able to do these things. These signals, it turns out, are important. People use signals in a very efficient way. Everything we do is based probabilistically on signals that are sent out. When I go to a traffic signal, 
If it's a green light, I don't look both directions to see if it's safe. I accept that as a very high probability that it's safe to cross the intersection. We use signals in hiring. We use signals in meeting prospective partners. We use signals all the time. Brand names serve as signals. They convey information, not perfect information. It's imperfect information, and that's what we're doing. So what are we credentializing at the undergraduate level? If, it's not, if we're not creating human capital, what is it we are creating? What is it, what kind of signals are we creating? Well, one of the things we're signaling is that if you went to, say, Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, you had the ability to get into a good school. And what that meant was, I had worked very hard when I was in high school. I had developed all of those outside activities that schools look for. And I had uh, done reasonably well on the SAT exams so that I, so that I got in. Okay. Um, it, certainly the signals that we send out are not signals that say, this person learned a lot. If we think, and if you think, that the signal that we send when we turn you out of university is to say to prospective employers or professional schools or whatever, this person learned a lot. Yeah, maybe you learned a lot for the exams, but do you still know it? Can you, do you still retain it? The answer is probably not. It may just be that when we turn students out of university, we're signaling that they have, uh, that they're intelligent, that they're motivated, and that they are willing to conform and subjugate themselves to the standards and the rules. Who are the people who are successful, in a sense, as undergraduates? They're the ones who are intelligent, they're motivated, they work hard, and they're willing to conform. Here's another personal story. When I was taking all of these economics and math courses at the University of Chicago, I was called into the office of the Director of Graduate Studies. He wanted to know what, what was going on. Why am I taking these courses? I'm registered in seminary. I said, well, I don't want to stay in seminary. I, I, I want to go on in economics and math. And I'd been doing well in Fogel's course. And I said, yeah, I'd like to stay here at the University of Chicago if I can. He said, well, what was your grade point when you were an undergraduate? Uh, I think I may have lied and told him 2.56 on a four-point scale. That's not very good for most of you who don't know that. That's not, you know, that's, that's sort of, you know, C average. And that's about, you know, maybe a little over a C average. He said, I've got to tell you, and there was just a, I, th I think I detected a hint of a sneer in his voice. I've got to tell you that I've done a lot of research on which students are likely to succeed in our program, and the best determinant is their undergraduate grade point. I said, but I got a 99 on the graduate record exam in economics. He said, that's the worst predictor there is for success in graduate school here at the University of Chicago. He said, the ne second best predictor is uh, re letters of recommendation from the professors. And just how do I feel? I, I rated my subjective feeling. Well, you can imagine that I was, gonna, I was not going to be too pleased about the letters of recommendation that they might have gotten from my economics professors at Carleton College after having uh, not done so very well there. We use signals a lot. For example, suppose you're hiring someone and uh, you have the choice between an MBA, that's a master's in business administration student, from Ivy, Schulich, or the Rotman School, top business schools in Canada. Or you could choose someone from, with an MBA from, say, Memorial University or Manitoba. Those are rated by most ratings as the, the, the lower rated business schools in Canada. If that's the only information you have, you're going to be more likely to, to accept that signal, where is the degree from, as an indication of something. Now, what does it indicate? Does it indicate that they're smarter and better and going to be better business persons? Well, probably it does because these people who got into those business schools, into the master's programs, got there by showing that they are motivated, they work hard, and they're fairly bright. That doesn't mean that it's a perfect filter. It doesn't mean it's a perfect signal. Not a, of course it isn't. But it is a, a reasonably good signal. When we hire people in the, at the, in the economics department at the University of Western Ontario, we, we recruit new PhDs from 
only the major schools, okay? We do not even consider interviewing people from the lesser schools. Why is that? Because getting more information is costly. It's extremely costly to go out and seek additional information. And as my current students and former students will be happy to tell you, at some point we make the decision that the expected incremental or additional costs of seeking additional information are greater than the expected incremental or additional benefits of seeking additional information. So we stop, even though there might, you know, we might be missing some people. But these are just some examples of how signaling can occur in, in the job market. But back to the undergra undergraduate education. If all we are doing, especially at the undergraduate level, is producing signals, that sounds a lot like what economists call a negative sum game. What I mean by that is that we're all devoting lots of society scarce resources to generating better signals out there in the job market. So, in order to get my kid into uh, an elite school, I have to make sure my kid goes to an elite prep school. In order to get my kid into an elite prep school, I have to make sure my kid goes to an elite private school. In order to get my kid into an elite private school, I have to make sure my kid goes to an elite preschool. And this is a lot of scarce resources. It involves a lot of scarce resources that are just self-canceling. I'm trying to make my kid look better. You're trying to make your kid look better. Everybody's trying to make their kids look better. We're all spending truckloads of money on, higher, uh, on education all the way through just to offset each other's signals. Not because they're gonna learn anymore, because we're trying to generate a more powerful signal than the next person. And if that's all we're doing is trying to generate a more powerful signal, it may very well be that education is this negative sum game, that we devote all of these resources and nothing happens. So these signals are useful, but let's not get too full of ourselves. And one thing I, I, I really wanna sort of skewer is, Let's not think we're doing wonders. Let's not justify this by saying that we're educating future vote voters. We're creating better citizens, blah, blah, blah. Well, given the stuff that people are taught in most higher education, you can imagine, those of you who know me, that I think they're probably training them to be worse citizens and worse voters anyway, so I'm not sure that I like the idea that we're, we're training these people to be better citizens. I've seen what I, the, what I teach have an effect on people. I have actually, at times, watched the lights turn on. And I love that experience. It's one of the things that keeps me going. Even though I am retired from the University of Western Ontario, I love teaching because I love to see those lights go on. I love to see the effect that, I, I like to think that what I do has an, has an effect and a positive effect on the students. But again, what's the counterfactual? What's the counterfactual? Would these students have learned the same thing from somebody else? Probably. Would these students have learned it in some other way? Probably. Did it matter even that they learned it? Because after all, they were just trying to learn something to pass my course. It's not something they're going to use later on in life, okay? Would they have been just as well off if they'd used their time doing something different? And for those of you who are economists, I'm asking about opportunity costs, right? What did they give up? Could they have been doing something different that might have been more valuable to them rather than play this negative sum game of trying to generate a more powerful signal? Well, these counterfactuals I have written in my notes are imponderables that are worth pondering. Okay, that's sort of stupid, isn't it? I'm not persuaded that what we do or what we teach matters one iota in the lives of most or maybe all students. They register, they pay, they study, they cram, they write exams and papers, they graduate, and it all has little or no bearing on the rest of their lives. They remember very little, if any, of what we taught them. All we have done is credentialize them. Relative to other options, relative to what else they might have done, we don't make much of a difference in their lives other than to provide a signal. Example, Jimmy graduated from UBC. He'd be a good catch. Susie went to Stevens Finishing College for Women. She'd be a good catch. Okay, 
these are the kinds of signals that are generated, right? When people meet in three minute date, time dating things, or when people uh, go online, you know, a lot of the things that people talk about are signals, right? And one of the things we generate is a signal that might be worthwhile out there on the meat market somewhere. Here's another example, however. When I first got to the University of Western Ontario, there was a student who had, who had left but had not finished his PhD, who, was, uh, who had published an article, just a small comment, but it was an article in the American Economic Review. That's, that was the number one journal back then. And this was a graduate student who had done it. We thought, boy, this guy must be bright. You know what? He never could get his PhD ex dissertation accepted because it wasn't very good. He continued to work in Ottawa, then he went to law school. He struggled in law school. In other words, he got lucky and generated a signal because we use signals in economics. Yeah, somebody has an AER, that's worth a lot. AER means American Economic Review. He has an AER, right? Okay, well, that, if somebody has an AER, that's worth a lot. And yet that was a false signal. They don't always work. What I'm trying to say is they're, they're imprecise because they don't give us all of the information. When I first floated these ideas out on, on Facebook with some of my friends um, some time ago, uh, one of my friends, with, who, who's a colleague from another institution, not Western, uh, said, but I, I used to sort of think that, but I look around and I see all of the benefits of higher education. People who are, are better educated have uh, a lower infant mortality rate, they have better health, they turn out to be better educated voters and better citizens lower crime rates, everything. And my reaction was, that wasn't education. You know, that wasn't education that did that. It's probably, a, education was a proxy for other things, like intelligence or other traits. If people are better educated, it's likely that they're, motiv they're better motivated and, and smarter. Well, people who are better motivated and smarter also are going to take more care of their, uh, of the prenatal care and natal care when they're giving birth to children. People who are smarter and better motivated are, going to look at, are more likely to look after their health a bit better. They're more likely to participate in, in uh, politics, et cetera. Again, it's a probabilistic statement, but it's probably just the case that education is a proxy for these things. Here's the deal. If human capital, if the human capital theory of education, and if human capital is so important, if learning is what higher education is all about and signaling is not, then why are there so few people sitting in on classes who aren't registered for them? In my career, teaching over 45 years, I think I've had two people sit in on classes, maybe three. You know, come up to me and say, I'm not registered for your class. Is it okay if I sit in on it? Now, some of you who are cynical say, that's just because you're a bad prof, let's face it. But other times, I don't think any other profs have had very many students, people sit in on their class, their, their lectures. I had one student who did sit in on the, lecture, the lectures and actually last the whole term. I've had students sit in on my lectures a couple of times, uh, maybe they were shopping or you know, just looking for another course. But for the most part, people don't do this. If learning is what it's all about, rather than credentialization, we would see many, many more people just begging to sit in on lectures, and we don't see it. Why do so few people make use of all of the free education that's available online? The Khan Academy is a wonderful source. TED Talks, a wonderful source. Wikipedia, jeez. Uh, I love Wikipedia. I learned lots of stuff there. Okay. Lots of people don't bother to take advantage of these things unless they can sign up for an online course and get credit for it. Credit, credentialization. That's what's important. Another example from the movie Good Will Hunting. Remember Good Will? He was making just, he was, you know, brilliant, learned all kinds of stuff. And he was teasing the frat boys 
about not having learned as much as he did because it's all available at no charge at the library. He just learned everything allegedly at the library. So what happens is that signaling means people learn more stuff for, the, for their courses using standard stuff. The texts, lectures, term papers, etc. And that's the stuff they forget most quickly. Well, less so the term papers. Why? Because term papers involve learning by doing. Lectures, books, it's not as, it doesn't become as personal. The learning by doing is clearly what is important if increasing human capital is important. Let me give you, this is a very hard to, hard to relate story. I, I haven't related this in public before. Those of you who are my students, or have been my students, know that I give a real kick-ass lecture on the economics of search, right? The economics of search for an apartment, for a job, for a life partner, for a one-night stand, whatever it is, okay? I'm, it's a great lecture. It's one that I give, that I used to give at Western to prospective students and their parents, and the students would all go, oh, the economics of one-night stands, ah! And the parents would go, ah! <laughs> as you can imagine. But it was a great lecture, and I understood the economics of search inside out. Then, one time I was taking a course at Ivy on how to write business cases, case study writing course. And they asked one person to, to teach the case that he'd written. It wasn't mine. Um, he taught this, course, this case, introduced the problem, the way they do in, in a case study business school course, introduced the problem on, and discussed this and discussed that. I didn't get it. I didn't have a clue what was going on. And then once somebody said, well, how long is this firm going to continue to search for information? Ah, oh, I remembered. I'd been teaching this stuff all my life. Not all my life. I've been teaching this stuff for at least 20 years, maybe 30 years. And I didn't, I couldn't apply it. I didn't see it in the real world. Oh, okay, so I can, I can train students and I can generate signals for the students. I, I can generate signals about me. I give a kick-ass lecture in search, right? But when it came time to applying it, I fell flat. It seems to me then that if we have to, that we have to learn by doing, and some of the strongest lessons come from our mistakes, trying things, doing things, figuring out what happened. One of my favorite lines is, history teaches us that we never learn anything from history. We have to experience it, it seems. That we learn, you know, and I don't want to put down history. I mean, I love reading history, I love studying it, all of that, I don't, but so many times we don't learn from history, especially from ourselves, in terms of our own lives and where we're going. So what, the, what does this mean for higher education? Well, one possibility is more online quizzing. When I was a graduate student, at Iowa State, you know that Iowa State has an, a big NCAA football team. And one of the ways that I supplemented my meager e income as a graduate student was I would tutor football players. And I, I don't remember what I was making, you know, two bucks an hour, three bucks an hour, it wasn't very much. You know. But uh, one time the coach came to me and said, John, we have this guy who's a monster man Okay, now the monster man was the term they used for the middle linebacker. We had this guy who's a monster man, and we have to have him remain academically eligible. We have a huge investment in him. I don't know what that meant. But we have a huge investment in him, and we will give you a bonus if you get him to pass the course. I was... I was thrilled, and yeah, maybe I can get a bonus. I thought afterwards, maybe the coach was trying to tell me, get a hold of the exam, get somebody to write it for him, something like that. That's not what happened, though. I took this guy, sat him down in the, the athletic study hall. We met once a week. I drilled him through the study guide that went, through the text, that went with the textbook, made him explain why all the wrong answers were wrong and why the right answers were right, 
Those of you who have been my students know that this is what I tell you to do because it worked with him. Um, the guy got a C in the course. He better than passed, he got a C in the course and I got a $40 bonus, which in today's money is probably worth about $500. It was worth a lot to, to us back then. It was great. But the problem is that what did I train him to do? I trained him to take an exam. Do you think he remembered much of the, the economics afterwards? Mm, yeah, I'm, I'd shake my head too if I were you. I, I doubt if he remembered much of it after the exam. But it was a great exercise for him to learn. So one of the things for learning by doing is more online quizzing, for sure, but they're going to be learning uh, how to take exams. Well, what about more case studies? If case studies worked for me, and because I'd done some teaching at the Ivy School in, in, at Western, um, I think I, case studies have a lot to recommend them. The problem is that they are very hard to prepare. Even if you take case studies that other people have written, they're hard to prepare. They're very hard to teach. They require a lot of work. You can't just go in there and go blah, 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 and write stuff on the board and say, here we are. Okay, so, and they're, because they require too much labor input, they're just too expensive. Let us suppose that the objective function, in other words, the goal of a university, is to increase its net present value. In other words, its value. What can a school do if all we're doing is generating signaling? The best way for a school to improve its net, well, its net worth is to generate stronger signals. How, how, is, it, how is a school going to generate stronger signals? Well, they could tighten up on admission, uh, admission requirements. And uh, you can imagine that uh, if, if uh, you look at the admission requirements at a school, let's say like uh, say the University of Sask Saskatchewan, where all you have to do is sign your name to a check and you're admitted, uh, the signal that comes out of that isn't so strong. But if you, come, you go to a school that has a higher admission standard, the, the signal might be, a little, might be a stronger signal. The other thing that, that, school, that uh, universities have to do is actually produce people who have learned something. What is it? One of my retired physician friends says that the, the learning by doing approach is right. But what he learned by doing was problem solving. Well, that's a lot of what case study does, again, in business school. It does, it's, it's problem solving. It's not specific things. How to maximize some objective function subject to some constraint using mathematics. But that all of this requires a lot more investment in teaching. And that seems to be the opposite of what is happening at many large universities these days. Well, what does all this mean about economics? After all, I've been using economics throughout the talk. In economics, we are also about signaling, but not just in hiring. We ask who teaches at what school, who's published how much, and if we want some additional metrics, well, not just how much have they published, but in what journals. Okay. Well, I think the profession seems to be determined to self-destruct on its economic models. It's going to self-destruct on approaches that do more, no more, then signal one's ability to do math and solve unique problems. Now, I was at one time one of the young Turks in the economics profession. I was a math jock, so to speak. I loved doing math and I loved lording it over others that I could do math. I think we've gone, the, I think we've gone way too far in that direction in, in, in the economics profession. When I look at the situation, I see lots and lots of journal articles that do nothing more than to say, look at me, I am a very good mathematician. Some people would say that's sour grapes on my part because I haven't kept up with the mathematics. And maybe it is. But at the University of Western Ontario now, graduate students are admitted into the graduate program in economics based on their ability in math. So much so that students are admitted into the graduate program and have been admitted into the graduate program there with no economics background whatsoever. All they have is math, physics, and engineering. Why? Because the directors, the various directors of the graduate programs 
know that in order to succeed in the graduate program at Western, you have to be good at math. You don't have to have a good intuition about economics. All you have to do is be good at math. Okay. Well, that makes life very difficult for those of us who were teaching the introductory course and had some of these folks assigned to us as teaching assistants who were actually in front of 20 students or 30 students and trying to answer questions about supply and demand and opportunity cost and some of the very basic things that we teach in the introductory course. These graduate students didn't have a clue. Now, when I was a graduate student, we always said that you learn more by teaching than you do by studying. And so that's, it's probably the teaching was good for them. But I certainly felt sorry for the poor students who were in those tutorials who were trying to learn some things. I don't want to deny the usefulness of mathematics. As I've said, I was a math jock at one time. At the same time, I just see far too much emphasis on some of the uh, more powerful mathematics, and I'm not sure what it does. Now, I expect that there's some of it's useful, but let me give you some examples. When I look at the, uh, all of the studies of economics about inflation and unemployment, what we call macroeconomics, all of the policies that people had come up with were failures in the 1970s, late 1970s and early 1980s. We know why now, even though Milton Friedman had told us over a decade earlier, he told us that expectations mattered, but people were not modeling expectations in their, mo in their mathematical models. And as a result, we pursued policies that, that, that thrust us into stagflation rather than into any, any sensible policy that might take expectations into account. One of the reasons we, the models were failures was because they're blunt. We look at four, five, six sectors in the economy and assume that that's everything there is. They don't address the very real sectoral variations in an, in an economy. For example, when construction workers lose their jobs in Nevada, Increasing the demand for health care workers in Arizona isn't going to help very much. It takes time and scarce resources for labor to adjust. Labor is not instantaneously mobile. And so many of these models make, that, make the assumption that it is. Another example, rational expectations. Rational expectations basically says that everybody everywhere understands everything there is to know about economics. Huh? Yeah, I don't blame you for looking puzzled. You know, this was an assumption that was being made in so many economics models throughout the, the 1980s and 1990s. They actually ran through the entire profession and devastated the profession the same way General Sherman devastated the state of Georgia during the Civil War. Rational expectations took over the entire profession, or most of it. But anybody who thinks about it at all realizes we're not rational. Mm -hmm. Even though we start with the assumption that people are rational maximizers, we know people aren't rational. I know I'm not rational. Now, of course, I justify that. I say, I'm, I rationally choose not to be rational. What that means is, I know I could be rational about this if I would spend more time and energy thinking about it, but I'd rather watch television. Okay. And some people talk about bounded rationality even, that it's impossible for us to be perfectly rational. But why don't we just say, okay, this rational expectations thing didn't work and we admit it. We cannot simply say everyone knows about opportunity costs because we know they don't. We cannot simply say everyone knows that people respond to incentives but bad economic policy shows us time and again that they don't know that. You'll have to excuse me for a minute here while we take a break. As I said, we cannot simply say everyone knows that people respond to incentives because bad policy suggests that people don't know that. Everyone doesn't know it. We cannot simply say that rent controls will lead to black markets, discrimination, tie-in sales, and a reduction in the quantity supplied of apartments. That is far from obvious for far too many people. 
We can teach these things until we're blue in the face. And students will memorize the answers they think we want. But far too many students will not understand, truly understand, the correct answers until and unless they experience them. What they say is, I'll tell the professor what she or he wants to hear, but I really don't believe it. So what happens is we learn from our experiences. How are we going to generate more learning at the same time that we're producing more signals in higher education? One possibility, more online work with the, uh, the online quizzing programs. I have found that students seem to do better on my exams with some of the online quizzing programs like Applia or My Econ Lab or any of the others. And it, you require students to do something every week and do, and do the work every week, keeping up with their work. But of course, all that's doing is generating the ability to take exams. I don't know that it's creating any more human capital. I don't know that it's giving any more learning by doing that's going to be uh, taken out into the real world. Another possibility is more field trips. Yes, even in economics. When I taught at the Bader International Study Center in England, we were required to give field trips for every course. One of the field trips that I had was to take my class. It was a class in the economics of sports. I took them into Eastbourne to the local football club, soccer club, to watch the World Cup. And the assignment was for them to estimate the impact of the World Cup and having this, this uh, event at the soccer club on the local economy. All of the students turned in these assignments, all but one of them turned in assignments saying, well, it's going to have this impact and this impact and this impact and this impact. I gave, and I wrote back to them all because this was all electronic submission and said, I want you to do it again. And this time I want you to read such and such a chapter before you do the assignment. And they realized that, oh yes, if the people hadn't been spending their money at the soccer club, they would have been spending it at the local pub. If they hadn't been spending it at the soccer club, they might have been spending it somewhere else. They might have saved it for a month or two and then spent it. But it wasn't all of that spending that got into the economy. The, the, the impact was just to divert the spending from one type of spend, uh, activity to a different type of activity. That's a lesson that most of them kept with them. They've told me since then that they, they learned from that. Once again, history teaches us that we don't learn from history. Rather, we learn from our experiences and especially our mistakes. Another possibility to increase learning is to have more, uh, case studies. This is hard. I've tried to do some case study work in some of my economics courses, and it's, it's very time consuming. I've also found that working in study groups helps. Working with other students works. It helps, my, it helps me get through the courses, but also what I'm talking about then is it increases and improves the quality of the signal. Maybe what we should do is just admit it. We're in the business of credentializing people. After all, we give them degrees, we give them credit. Why don't we just say that? We're in the business of credentializing people, generating what we think are strong signals. We don't care about the human, yeah, of course we care about the human capital, but we, why don't we admit that it's not really happening very much? What is it that we want to signal then? We want to signal that our students will be good workers for you, the employers. We want to signal that our students will be good students for you, for graduate schools and professional schools. And if that's the signal we want, then we're probably moving in the right direction. We sort incoming students by their probability of success as undergrads, we ultimately test their stamina, their willingness to work, their willingness to work hard, and their willingness to conform to the rules that we set in the classroom and in the university. We may call this a contribution to human capital, but for the most part, it isn't. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, uh, uh, if you have any questions, I mean, I know I've gone over the top in some of the statements that I've made, so I'm willing to back up. Yes? Yeah, I have all three questions to ask you. Okay. Uh, the first question is at the beginning. 
beginning of the lecture, uh, you said you really like the econo economic courses, and uh, but uh, but you you said at that time you experienced the law F E B B law F of economic exam. Yes. So so that question is uh, how do you overcome that hardship time about that? Okay. The question is a general question about how would students who've struggled and not done so well, yeah, how would they overcome that? Okay, I think that's a, that's a really good question. I'm going to give you two answers. The first answer is marry the right person. <laughs> and what I mean there is um, the father of my first wife was an economist. And uh, it was because of him that I managed to get into graduate school at all. He had been an acting chair at Iowa State University. Uh, he had left, but uh, it was because of him I got in there. Fortunately, only one, per fortunately, only one person there knew my connection to him. And I say fortunately because I was determined I was going to make my, make my own life and demonstrate. So I, I got a second or third chance. How do you overcome a bad thing? Well, the other thing is to do what I did, and that is I took the math courses over again to make sure that I got you know, the high grades and that I learned the math that I had to learn. Um, if I were in today's uh, university menu and it suddenly dawned on me after three or four years that, geez, I really like economics. I'd like to go on in economics and study economics. If I could afford it, I would go back, take the courses again. Take the and I would take them for credit. Why? Because I'd have to send the signals to graduate schools that I have the determination and the ability to do well in this field. Otherwise, it's hard to overcome it. I got lucky. OK? Let me take another question from someone else. If there is one, then I'll come back and take the rest of yours. Okay. Are, you, okay? Are there other questions? Yes. Back in the back. Yes. Absolutely right. You're, you're, well, I, I, I'll give you two answers for that, too. Number one. Most of the professors I had at Carleton College were what I call East Coast liberal interventionists. In other words, the stuff that they were teaching was stuff I couldn't understand because it was all wrong. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, a second answer is, I got lucky. I did not, I mean, while I was there, I was, while I was there, I was doing the, I was giving the wrong signals. But that's just the, you got lucky afterwards. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I'm going to, I think you're probably right. I think if I had gone right from undergraduate to graduate school, I would not have been a success. If I'd gone right from undergraduate, in fact, even if Chicago had admitted me, I would probably have failed out in their graduate program. I wasn't ready for that at that point. Um, so that's, that's another thing. I mean, the signals did say this guy isn't going to do very well in graduate school. And it was only because of a number of things, including getting into Iowa State, uh, plus studying very hard in some of the courses early on, on my own, because I, I, I was determined I was going to make it on my own and not ride my then father-in-law's coattails. Uh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. You know, I went through graduate school. And, and here's, here's another example of signaling. One of the things that graduate schools do is they send they give recommendations. They rank, you know, we, when we're hiring at Western, we want to know how, have you, how do you rank the four graduate students you have that you're, who are looking for jobs right now? We ask the, the, the placement director, how are they ranked by the faculty? Don't ask about grades, we ask how the faculty rank them. And that's important because we won't talk to anyone from a second tier school who's not number one or number two in their school. We won't talk to anyone from a, a top tier school who's more, lower than number four. Okay, so these rankings matter. What happened at Iowa State? Well, when I was a graduate student there, 
I made it really obvious. I did not want to go to a publisher parish research institution university. I wanted to go to a small liberal arts teaching college like Carleton College. I got a job offer from the University of Western Ontario. Talk about publisher parish. That place was known as a revolving door. They hire people and fire them. You know, they were hiring 10 every year and firing eight every year when I went there. Why did I take the job? It was a very good offer. I called up Ada May, uh, Ms. Harrison, the, the, the chair at uh, Carleton College, and said, I've got this offer from Western University. She said, take it, John, which is her way of saying, we're not going to offer you a job. Don't worry about it. <laughs> OK. So um, what happened at Iowa State, though, was because I had made it clear I wanted to teach at a small liberal arts school, they ranked me third, even though I was clearly the number one graduate student. I, I know I'm bragging, but I was clearly the number one graduate. They ranked me third because they weren't going to be able to place the other two who wanted to do research if they were ranked two and three coming out of Iowa State. If they were ranked one and two, they would get, they'd be able to get better jobs. The only reason I got a job at Western, again, fortuitous. I'd been at a conference with uh, one of, a student who was a year ahead of me. We developed a, a mutual admiration society for each other. Uh, in particular, we were referring to uh, some, of the, some of the professors and uh, what we thought was wrong with them, as graduate students can do. And uh, he, t he got a job at Western, deservedly, the year before I did. And uh, when they were hiring their 10 new PhDs the next year, he strongly recommended that they give me a job offer. And that's, it was just, again, connections. Remember all the stuff I teach you intro students at the beginning? When we ask, who gets the goodies? Yeah, well, connections determines who gets the goodies. And it was just... Okay, so I got, I got lucky. Derek, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, okay, now, you talk about uh, building our human capital, and I think if you get it by doing, however, by doing, that assumes that we have enough connections to get in. How do you overcome that? That is a very good question. One would think that if learning by doing is so important, a co-op program would be really valuable, that students should be able to get in, involved in their, the field of study and then go out and do some, and then come back and, and study some more, and then go out and do some, and you know, put meat on the bones. And that sort of thing actually works in some fields. Quite frankly, if someone hired me to set up a co-op co program in economics, I would go the other direction. I have no idea how to. I mean, who is going to want to hire somebody yeah, who's got a sort of a, a 60 average, yeah, or a 70 average even, and let them run some, what, what are they going to do? They're going to run some financial fund? Uh, are you going to run a money, uh, money market fund for them? No, they're going to do, you know, if you hire them on a co-op program, they, the, the best they can do is some sort of grunt work, and maybe that's a good way to learn a little bit about what goes on in the office. But, uh, it, Learning by doing for economics is really tough. However, business schools are very good at it, of course, with case studies and uh, requiring that students go out and actually start a business, which is one of the things that happens in many of the business schools. Economics, it's very tough to run a co-op program now. I don't know, even at Waterloo, does anybody know if they run a co an economic co-op program at Waterloo? I don't think they do. But they're big at co-op there. And that, that, that would be a great idea. One of the things that I think I should have done as an undergraduate, coming back to your question earlier, I, I had no business staying in, in, in undergraduate school. I, I didn't belong there. I should have been out doing something else um, and should have gone back when I was more mature. My wife didn't start school till she was 20, didn't start university till she was 27. Each of my two sons took a year out, and one of them took two years out at different times, took time out because they knew they were wasting their time. And I know I was wasting my time and, and, and money uh, by, by uh, being in school. Okay? Yes, another question. Yeah, another question. Based on what I've said, what, what do I really think are the implications for higher education, given my way of thinking? I'm not going to be able to convince anybody, given the way budgets work, given the way administrations work, I'm not going to convince anybody 
that we should go back to using smaller classes, assigned, st uh, assigned study groups, and case study methods of teaching. I've never taught that way myself. I wouldn't know how to do it. But I do know it takes a lot of time. And given that it takes a lot of time to do those things, that means the teaching faculty would have to increase dramatically. That's not going to happen. Universities are cutting down on teaching faculty. They're, it's, if anything, they're building the administration, but certainly not in building the, 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 uh, the teaching faculty. And if they're not building the teaching faculty, then what is the next best thing that universities can do? Generate a stronger signal? Okay. How do we generate a stronger signal? We try to make sure that our students learn as much in the classroom for those exams as we can teach them. Case study will help. Experiences will help. I think online teaching and online, online quizzing is an important way to go. Online education has, has, has taken a big step forward, partly because there are a lot of people who are making a lot of money at it, selling things like Applia and My Econ Way. And they're making money because they've figured out how to deal with the monitoring problem. How do you know that the person who's taking this online quiz is really the student who, who, says, he, who says he or she is, right? Uh, how do you know that, that the student is, doesn't have the book open? Well, you think of them as open book quizzes, let's face it. But I think that that kind of thing, getting students to, just to keep up with their work, is, a really, is, is an important step toward getting stronger, better signals. Because when we turn students out of here, we want to make sure that the students are going to represent the university well, because this, the quality of the signal that we send is going to depend on the quality of the students. Right? So that begins with trying to admit, you know, raise the admission standards, if we can, rather than trying to build the size of the university, build the quality of the university. It also involves trying to make sure that the students who get out actually deserve to get out. And I noticed recently that there's a proposal in the US to tie funding to universities to graduation rates. Uh, the reason I'm groaning about that is you know that if the university funding is tied to graduation rates, everyone who signs a, pay, signs a check is going to graduate, whether they deserve to or not. That's a big mistake. That's a really big mistake. Um, I think that if universities want to, want, want to send out stronger signals, they're also going to have to send out a signal that they're not afraid to fail people, that they're not afraid to fail people who show a lack of motivation, that they're not afraid to show, uh, fail, fail people who won't do the work. So that's, a, that's another way to toughen the signal. Rick. So let's suppose you're right, that universities are all about signaling, and that none of us remember anything in the courses that we take. If that were true, that would be also true then in the science discipline, in the STEM discipline. Um, why then do governments and firms want to have more students taking that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. What do those courses signal? signify? What, what kind of signal is sent by someone who takes a math course or a chemistry course or a physics course or an engineering course? It signals that this person has the ability to do the math and to work hard to get through these courses. It, signify, it signifies intellectual ability, in the, a quantitative intellectual ability, and it signals and a willingness to work, a willingness to work hard. Okay, Compare that, contrast that with one of my favorite whipping boys, sociology. <laughs> what does what does it signify? What does it what, what does it, what, what does it signify when people study sociology? That, that, that they're good at sitting around navel gazing. No, 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 I don't mean that completely. I mean, I, I mean, I have published. I have published in sociology journals and sociology books. Okay, just so you, so you, you know that I'm not completely opposed to sociology, but uh, it's a different it's a different kind of signal. It's a, and so I think that a lot of that is a signal. We want this sieve, this sieve, this bit of credentializing, to indicate which students are going to be more likely to do this work well when they get on the job. Now, of course there are some skills. Of course there are. You go through mathematics, and you stay in mathematics. You go through physics, and you stay in physics. You go through chemistry, and you stay in physics. And then you go out on the job, and you're still using the same stuff that you've used, and those things build on each other. Okay? So a lot of that is going to stay because it's repeated trials. 
It's repeated, repeated learning. I mean, one of the things I learned in the only psych course I ever took was that if you have spaced repeated trials, the rats are more likely to remember how to get through the maze. Okay. Well, the same thing is true with students. Sorry, students, we don't mean to think of you as rats. But what I mean is that if we space the trials and, and, and continue you know, repeated, repeated trials, repeated exposure, then people are going to be more likely to retain the, what they've learned. And I think that's definitely true in chemistry and physics and any field that builds on itself. Now, we would think that that would happen in, in economics because we build on ourselves in economics, too. And maybe it does now. Maybe I'm out of touch with what the graduates know when they get out of graduate school, out of undergraduate school. And if they go on to graduate school, maybe they'll be, maybe it'll still be fresh, some of it. And if they don't go on to graduate school, maybe in two years they won't remember a thing. And maybe they'll look back at their old exams and say, "Gee, I can't believe I knew that," the same way I did. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Yeah. I, I really do. Um, according to you, higher education is all about signaling uh, certain personality traits like intelligence, uh, motivation, willing, willingness to sort of knuckle under and do it. But um, I think you just have to think of the counterfactual, as you yourself said. Yes. Why not? just to give everyone an IQ test and a personality test instead of all this classroom stuff. It would be way cheaper. Why not just do all that? Wouldn't we just get the same thing in the end? And I say, no, we wouldn't. I think you're wrong. That's why I think you're wrong, because we wouldn't get the same thing. Because what people learn in universities is not just the actual math or no particular bits of knowledge. They actually learn how to signal. So it's learning to signal better. There's one of the things you teach. I'll buy that for sure. I'll buy that so one for that, sure. That is something that's worthwhile and value, valuable to, to, to the students. Do you, so well, I think your sort of attempt at sort of deflation, by the way, I think this is an economist sort of stig signaling strategy. That, they, they like signaling that they're sort of hard-headed and that they sort of <laughs> deflate other people's sort of woolly stuff. I think, I think you're wrong in that way. Well, if, if you think that one of the most valuable things that students learn, and, and, and I don't know that you do, but if you think that one of the most valuable things that students learn in university is how to signal better, that seems to me that to, to support what I'm saying. And it doesn't mean that they couldn't learn to signal better somewhere else. Um, I, 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 I will grant that in university, hmm, no, I didn't learn to signal any better in university. I learned to signal better when I was in graduate school, but that's because I was a good graduate school student and a, and a horrible undergraduate student, so maybe that's a difference. I don't want to go completely overboard on this, but I think the signaling part is awfully important, and I'm glad to hear you say that I think one of the things, that you think one of the things the students learn is how to signal better. What are some of the ways that you... If your theory of signaling is true, I think that, that is the value If the theory, well, I think, and I think it's a pretty valuable thing to learn. How do I signal to people that I will be a good prospective partner? How do I signal to people that I will be a good prospective employee? How do I signal to people that I will be a good prospective student in your professional school or graduate school, right? Well, we're taught from an early age, I don't know, we have to go to university. We're taught you have to work hard, you have to get good grades to get into the right school. To, uh, we're taught that you, know, you have to um, somehow convince the professors that you're uh, a worthy scholar. I, I finally learned that, that I, I certainly wasn't very good at it as an undergraduate. So, I mean, and so we're taught to, to play the signaling game. Now, again, if I thought that personality tests and IQ tests could do all of this, I might go along with your suggestion to some extent, but I'm not convinced that they're very good predictors uh, by themselves. You know, sure, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about things like motivation and character traits and, and, and IQ tests, but I, uh, I don't think there are simple measures of that that are going to be perfect predict predictors. And as was turned out in my case, 
Yeah, okay, I did go on to become a decent economist. Well, standard, though, but a university degree isn't a perfect predictor. Either, yeah. That's right. So Absolutely. You're not comparing... Well, you're, you're right, I'm not comparing... I mean, I'm speaking always in probabilistic terms, you know, roughly speaking, on average, okay? Yeah, did you start to... Yes. So, expanding on this idea that yeah. universities are very good at saving money, saving money, and indeed they are, uh, jobs are also very good indicators if you're a manager that signals that you have at least some ability to get exactly. around people for an extended period of time. Uh, but going on with this idea, I, I disagree with a lot of what you're saying. Indeed, you're saying that universities are great at saving money, so what? So are suspenders, so are ties. Uh, yes. More importantly, what do universities do? <coughs> One of the fundamental things is they teach you how to think. Indeed, how to approach a problem. From what I've done, I present to you, and I would assume be in favor of having perhaps a one or two year program whereby you're very narrow and focused, and you only enter this program once and you know what you want to be. I've got to tell you, that's a really hard thing to put on your resume. I'm very good at programming only one language, I'm very good at only analyzing stuff by supermarkets. That's how I see this. Oh. But really, you need that exposure. You're going to forget some things. It's sending the signal that you're aware of things that are available. You can approach problems. And you can learn from the mistakes and learn and grow from your study. Uh, take any fourth year writer and compare it to his first year work, and it'll show definite progression. So I, I agree with what you're saying in the sense that there's great inflation. We put far too much focus on what school we go to and rather than just learning for the heck of it, we just want to get that piece of paper. But I think something's missing in your argument. And I think that's just the idea that you learn to think. I'm not convinced that we learn to think in university. That's, that's part of what, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm giving this talk, especially as undergraduates. Um, we like to think that we, as professors, that we are helping students learn how to think. But for the most part, what I see is students who are, who are learning how to generate stronger signals, students who are le learning how to pass exams, students who are trying their best to, to generate the strongest signal at the lowest cost to themselves. That's a little too strong, but r roughly, okay? I don't see the courses teaching people how to think think. I don't even know. Every, I used to think that that was what was going on. Oh, I'm teaching you how to think. Economics is about the, you know, the science of choice and decision making. Oh, it was about optimization and mathematics and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't teaching students how to think. When I teach my courses, you know, and you can, you can look around, you know, there are probably 10 people here who have been students of mine at one time or another. You can, you can talk to them afterwards and find, I don't know that I have ever taught them anything about how to think. Well, maybe the concept of opportunity costs, which is something that underlies all of economics. Maybe. But I, I don't know. I mean, I would like to. I would like to have that as a goal. You and I might have different objectives about what it means, or definitions of what it means. But that by itself is not what pe the stu most students are here for. If they were here for, for learning how to think, they can, they, can, they can watch Khan Academy, they can watch TED Talks, they can read books. They're here to get credentialized. And that's what we're, here for. That's what we're doing, is we're credentializing these kids. Now, we're hoping that we teach them how to think, whatever that might mean. We're hoping we teach, we teach them how to think better than they would otherwise. And in the process, we do expose them to new ideas, whether they remember them or not. Maybe the expo and maybe, to, to, to answer your question a bit more, maybe one of the things that happens is that I don't remember Plato. I don't remember a thing from Aristotle. I don't remember a thing from most of the courses I took, but maybe the exposure to new ideas and the exposure to new ways of thinking was something that was valuable and it had an influence on my life. I don't know how to, I don't know how to, to even represent that. I went to a small liberal arts school. Both of my sons went to Canadian universities, but specialized in small liberal arts programs in those, in those schools. I think there's some kind of value that I cannot quantify from being exposed to lots of new ideas. I love it. 
Um, that's one of the reasons I am such a dilettante uh, in, in my life and, and do so many different things, music and drama and uh, uh, all kinds of other things as well. So it's, I, I, love, the, I love this, uh, being able to, to be exposed to, to new things and learn them. But you know, I've developed this, lo this love of knowledge in the last 15 or 20 years. It's, uh, I didn't have it when I was a student. Not until, well, I had it in graduate school. I, I did, and it, I think it, that helped. I don't know if I de dealt with your question or not, but I'll take one more now from you, and then we'll go. We'll go. And then, we'll, uh, and then I'll go to someone else again. Hmm. I have a last question. Yes. Okay, the question is, what, if I can rephrase this, students come to university and then they, 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 when they're done, they still have trouble getting jobs. Yeah. So what, 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 what does that say about signaling? What does that say about what I've been talking about if, they still, if, they, if the signals aren't very good and they can't find jobs? Let me answer that again in two different ways. Number one, we, we, out, out in Regina, if there's a university graduate who can't find a job, I suspect they graduated from Lethbridge, not from here. Okay, it, it, what I'm trying to say is they graduated from some other university because anybody, I, I could get a job tomorrow if I walked out in, 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 in Regina. I, I, so so you're obviously you're not talking about Regina, you're talking about something like maybe Southwestern Ontario where I'm from you have to search pretty hard to find a job. And having a university degree is going to increase the probability that you will find a job. And it doesn't, it's not a guarantee of a job because the unemployment rate's 9% there. When the unemployment rate is at its natural rate of say 6.5%, then people are gonna find it more likely, much easier to find jobs. The university degree has never been a guarantee that you will find a job. It's a guarantee that you have a signal that you have done something in your life. What have you done in that life? What does the university degree mean that you have done? It means that you have worked hard, or some of you haven't actually. Uh, you've done enough work anyway to get a good enough grades to get this, dipl this, this, graduate, this diploma, this degree. Um, that will serve as a signal to employers. Okay. Now, maybe the only employers who are going to want the signal from Lethbridge, let's say, are people who are telemarketers. But, but maybe the signal from some other university, say, University of Regina, would mean that more employers would be more interested in, in hiring you because they have, how do they know? The only way they're going to know the value of the signal is with experience, right? And trial and error. And if you go out there and get a job someplace with a University of Regina degree and you screw up and you lose the firm $2 million, they're going to say, oh, we're never going to hire anybody from Regina again, right? So one of the things that Regina wants to be careful about is make sure we turn out people who can do what we say they can do, right? I don't know if that, any, any other questions? Back in the back. Yes, that's, that's exactly what I was talking about, that there is indeed uh, a negative sum game, not just, and, and that's a good extension actually, I, I see what you're asking. Because the, the arms race is between, 
individuals and parents trying to get their kids better. But then you're talking about the schools too. Of course there's a, yes. How do we generate better signals? Well, we try, we're going to have to go out and get the best professors. We're going to have to go out and uh, get the best teaching programs. We're going to have to have uh, more funds to hire, the, uh, to, to attract the, the, the smartest and uh, most highly motivated students. That's one of the reasons. Right. I don't quite know what you mean, but it might take the shape of failing students who aren't going to send, uh, give good signals. Is that what you're saying? I wonder if the university would try to sort of massage the data. Of course. Of course. It happens all the time they're trying to massage the data. Look, we have a graduation rate of 92% of here, or whatever it is. But that's not going to help signaling in the, in the future. It signals now, what the, what's the signal? We graduate 92% of all incoming students. That signal is to all high school students, that's an easy place to go to school, right? If, if, the, if the signal is, we, gradu we graduate only 58% of the students who enroll in our, pro in our programs, whoa, that's tough. That's gonna mean something if I get through that program. Okay. But too many, too many schools are taking the approach you're talking about. Massaging the data. And of course they massage the data. We want to appear number one in the McLean's rating, right? Even though we don't trust the criteria they use, it doesn't matter. How many people pay attention to the criteria? Not many. Not many other than university presidents and PR hacks. Yeah, it's, it's you know, you say, oh, well, geez, where does, where does University of Regina stand in the McLean's rankings? Do they even look at us? I don't know. Probably not very high. I know that at Western, they're always, they always have their knickers in a knot about where they are in the rankings. It's pretty funny, actually. When you, and, and Carleton College is very proud of the fact that I, I don't know that they've ever not been in the top 10 of small liberal arts schools ever since I first wrote to them zillions of years ago. Yeah. So people pay attention to rankings. Those rankings are, are, are important signals. How do they get higher in the rankings? Signaling. We have this many graduates who went to graduate school. Well, let's get our graduates into graduate school, okay? We have this many graduates who became medical doctors. Let's make sure they get to med school. We have this many graduates who became lawyers. Let's get them into law school. They have this many graduates who've become millionaires. How are we gonna do that, right? Maybe we could steal and, no, I don't know. But I mean, we have, I mean, those are the kinds of criteria. We have a library that's got 16 zillion books in it. Uh, that's another uh, uh, criterion that's used sometimes. We have uh, student-faculty ratio. We, and you, you look at how these schools calculate their student-faculty ratios. It, you know they're lying. You, you know, or, or let's say, not lying. They, they are using every possible escape to try to make sure that the student-faculty ratio looks lower than it probably is. So they're going to count all their sessional instructors and, so in the, you know, and, and, and people who, who show up every once in a while or people who are on research leave or whatever just to make it look as if they have more faculty members than they do. Of course they massage the data. You're absolutely right. Another hand. Charles. Yeah, I just want to know how credential petition, I'm not sure in the program, but The question from Charles is, uh, uh, how, how, do, how does credentialization become so important and how does it generate the signals? Okay, well, the way I think it works is that you get a credential. The credential is called a university degree. Okay? So that's already signaled something about what you can and cannot do. It's, it's signaled that you can do the work and get through university. Then the second part of the signal is where is it from? Is it from University of Lethbridge? Is it from University of Re Regina? Is it from Trinity College at U of T? Is it from McGill? Is it from Carleton College? Is it from one of these other places that has very restrictive admissions? If, it has, if it's from a place that has very restrictive admissions, that means that's, a more, that's, a, that's a, a more powerful signal than one that might come from, say, some place where you can get in no matter what. It's, it, it is the truth that um, when, I, when I went to Carleton College, uh, I looked around and the, the, during the, the freshman orientation week, all of these students were comparing their SATs you know, they're, they're scholastic aptitude test scores. You, know, you might as well get the rulers out. And, you know, it's, it's that kind of measurement. Um, and what was going on was they were all sort of 
trying to establish where they were in the pecking order. I did not talk about my SATs. They were good for where I came from. But where I came from had the highest high school dropout rate in the United States when I was there. It was not that, shall we say, it, was, it wasn't a, a really difficult place to be a student if you wanted to be a student and do well. The SATs were good, but I looked around and what was going on was that these people were already credentializing themselves right from the beginning, sending out these signals. These are my SAT scores. These are my SAT scores. Yeah, well, I got, a, yes, I, I got an 800 in that. 800? I mean, that was back when an 800 on, a, on the SATs meant something, too. They've even, they actually had grade inflation in the SATs, believe it or not, the scholastic aptitude tests. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. I know the owl is still open on Friday night, and uh, I'm hoping that someone will meet me there and buy me a beer. Thank you very much.